I offer this to you in the name of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Please be seated. This morning, there are readings about being known, deeply known, deeply seen by God. My focus this morning is Psalm 139. Those beautiful words we just read together that are so often used in times of stress, uh, at, at, a, at an, a bedside, in illness, times when we need reassurance and encouragement. Lord, you've searched me out, known me. You know my sitting down, my rising up. You know every word on my lips. You're behind me, you're before me. Where can I go from your spirit? The uttermost parts of the sea, the heavens, the earth, everywhere. You are there for me. I could take the winds of the morning and, and fly away and you would still be there with me. No matter what I go through, there you are. It is a lovely, lovely psalm that we read so often for reassurance and confirmation that Christ is always, always nearby. But it is the second part of the psalm that gives the first part its kick. It's the ending verses that load the first verses with deeper power. So all you have to do is pick up your book of occasional services and turn the page to page 898 to hear the rest of what the psalm says, which is, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. You that thirst for blood, depart from me. They speak despitefully against you. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those, O oh Lord, who hate you? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. They have become my own enemies. Well, now, that's a change of tune. <laughs> that's a little bit of edge. Now, when I was being trained up for ministry, uh, those who taught me, nurtured me in the understanding that the Psalms were given to us as inspired language, divinely inspired language given to the psalmist, given to the psalmist to write down, to read, to sing, to share with a God-seeking people, words given for the people to voice back to God. Words given to humans as a sign and a signal and a permission to speak your heart. Our raw truth that God is prepared to hear. So that which we good Christian folks would like to edit, God can take in entirely. That which the most well-meaning of liturgical theologians trim out, God would prefer us to read intact. That which we might not find suitable at all to say in public, out loud, to ourselves, let alone to one another, God requires us to confront as a crucial part of our whole story. So what the appointed lectionary selectively sidesteps, God slams back down in front of us in bold print. It's that second part that gives the first part its credibility. God, you've searched me out and known me. All of me encompassed in the embrace of the holy. Now, God might not condone and approve of every aspect and attitude of our self-expression. As theologian Phyllis Tribble once noted in one of her, one of her more challenging books, she said, just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean God approves of it. But it is in the Bible so that the Psalms are given to us to understand that God can cradle and can contain all our agitation and emotion for God knows we are only human. It is not what we think or we feel or we say to God that makes us or breaks us. God is not offended by honesty. 
but limiting God to our own personal point of view, well, that can be a problem. So, you know, let me, let me, you know what, let me put it to you this way. There is a Sufi story that kind of demonstrates my point about getting stuck. So it said that um, Jesus is walking down the road and a well-known and upright righteous disciple joins him on the path and they discuss many important things as they walk along. And then from out behind some rocks and trees, a notorious brigand, a, a thief, overhears them walking. And he creeps out and follows behind, saying to himself, if I can just get close enough, if I can hear the words, if I can come close to the holy, maybe some blessing will land on me just as the dust rises from their feet as they walk. And he comes closer and closer to here. But as he comes closer, the righteous disciple sees him and steps a little closer to Jesus. And they walk along and Jesus takes a step and makes some space and the righteous one steps a, a little closer, keeping an eye on that one there, who is trying to get just near enough to the Holy One to be blessed. And they walk along, and the brigand tries to keep up, and the disciple closes him out. And all at once, Jesus stops, and he turns to that brigand and says, what are you looking for? What do you want? And he said, oh, uh, I, I, seek, I seek knowledge. I seek wisdom. I seek understanding. I seek your favor. And he turns to the righteous disciple and says, what are you looking for? He says, oh, I'm, I'm looking for knowledge. I'm looking for wisdom. Uh, I'm seeking understanding and your favor. And Jesus turns to the brigand and says, then you shall have that. Rest easy, my friend. All your past deeds, all the wrongs you have done, all the crimes you have committed, all the hurt you have caused is forgotten, utterly gone. And he feels blessed. And then Jesus <clears throat> turns to the righteous disciples and says, and all your past deeds, all the good you did, all the money you gave, all the learning you have is also forgotten. Because you lacked respect for your fellow traveler in faith. So Jesus and the brigand now walk on and the righteous disciple is stuck in himself and is left behind. It is not what we think or feel that makes or breaks us, but limiting God to our own point of view. That can be the problem. Which is why it's important to also know the very closing of this psalm. Because herein there's, there's all that angry stuff and then there's search me out, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my restless thoughts. Look well where there be any wickedness in me and lead me in the way that is everlasting. A confessional self-awareness. A sigh and a pivot. The psalm singer realizing that allegiance to God is not measured by alienation from others. The quality of our relationship to God is measured by the quality of our relationship to others. That, that turn there makes me think of, of, of an Appalachian folk hymn that says, God's still working on me, because I ain't what I'm supposed to be. <laughs> and on it goes. Or there's, that, there, there's that, lovely, that lovely line that Amy Adam has in the movie Junebug from quite some time ago where she comes up to her husband and she says, God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Someone just said, say that again. <laughs> we can, we'll all say that again later, right? But now, for a good length of time here, there has been an expectation of change to come. There's been planning, designing, discussing, deciding. There's a meeting that happens shortly, and now the time has come will change will happen. Lay leadership will change. Music leadership will change. The person of your priest will change. The building will change. And there may be many feelings around all of that. Of course, there will. Outbursts of excitement or frustration can be expected as a normal part of the process. Of course, it is. Not a problem. But being stuck in that emotion or that outburst, stuck in that state, that could be. The psalmist sings in humble prayer and heated sputtering freely to God, for the psalmist and God know they are ineluctably and eternally secure in, as it were, their holy communion. A righteous disciple in that story would have done well to remember that. He forgot the circle. It's what we hope for here. And in an interim time, there's often this golden vision that all things in the community will come to consensus. But for all the particularities that are involved in this coming time and that have been involved up to this coming time, we cannot expect to agree on everything. But there is one thing we can all agree upon. Our first and foremost consensus is that we agree to be a community. We agree to be one another, the body of Christ in this place. That's our primary agreement. And to hold that as sacred gives us the space about four verses worth of space, give or take, to hash everything else out within the greater self-understanding of our mutual belovedness of God always. Community. That's our consensus. And the rest follows on from that. So now in about 40 minutes time, we will embark together on one more step of change. But be of a mind that over these coming months, we may not agree on all of the particulars, but we can agree, as the psalm says, that we are a body searched and known, marvelously made in all its various and vibrant parts, ineluctably and eternally bound together in our holy communion. So the psalm begins, Lord, you've searched me out and known me. And it concludes, search me out, O God, and know me. So in that alpha and omega of God's encompassing presence through it all, this community we take to the path.